morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Wonderful. Very good. All right, good. I heard some very good, some wonderful. Hosanna. Hosanna. Amen. It's Palm Sunday. Amen. 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 And we're going to praise the Lord just like those people did on Palm Sunday when the Lord entered into Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to sing a song. If you'd stand with me, we're going to sing a song about how amazing God's love is. Hallelujah. Everyone say it with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Your love is amazing. Send your angels to be with us today. Do the spiritual battles that need to be done. Holy Spirit, draw those. Convict them. Guide us. Fill us. Love us. We praise you, God. Lord, we just know that our country and our world is crazy. And people are attacking uh, everything that you stand for. So, Lord, I pray a blessing for us that we would remain strong. As we heard last week, just to have that revival spirit to, to go into the world and tell people about Jesus. But Lord, we just celebrate you. We thank you now. Guide us. Let everything be done for your glory. Speak through me. Speak to me. Speak to us, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Be seated. If you did not get a bulletin, you know we don't do bulletins every week anymore, but uh, we do them for Palm Sunday and Easter and other special big days. If you didn't get one, they're at the doors. A uh, couple of things I just want to draw your attention to. Uh, coming up, especially this coming Friday, Good Friday, we are entering Passion Week. Now, for those who say, well, what is that? The last week that God, uh, His Son, was here. As we look at that, you know, today we talk about Him. He would have entered the uh, temple and would be saying Hosanna, but then uh, things got bad quick. So, but this Friday, we're doing something we've never done before. I've never been a part of. We're going to be joining with four other churches, five churches serving and worshiping one Lord. We're going to, yeah, isn't that awesome to say? Five different churches getting together, and uh, we're going to be meeting at Harvest Baptist Fellowship. It's very close to us. It's just down the street. The address is printed in your bulletin. It is on the street talks. It is on the emails. It is on the website. It, you can find this place. 
You can even <laughs> walk there if you really wanted to from here. It'll take you about 20 minutes. Absolutely. It's not that far. The what? Yeah, can you, you walk the sidewalk down that way? Uh, it's on Himes Avenue, just down the road at 5902 North Himes. Those of you that grew up in Tampa may remember it used to be a Nazarene church there on Himes, just north of Hillsboro, corner of Ottawa. I'm a, so everybody know where we're going? If you have a phone, Google it, map it, GPS it, find it. But we will begin Friday night, uh, 7 o'clock, five churches coming together. The worship leaders from all five churches will be leading us in worship that night. So Ryan will be on up there with the ensembles leading us in worship. My very dear friends from the other four churches will all be preaching. We'll all be given 10 minutes. So come for the Easter miracle and see if five pastors can all preach for 10 minutes. So I was just telling Amy that the section of scripture I have is over 20 verses. And I got to I start off with 12 pages of notes. I've got it down to three and a half, which for me, that is a miracle in itself. So i got to figure out how to take 22 verses and give you all 10 minutes worth of stuff. I could take me almost 10 minutes to read the verses. Uh, we're going to have a great time, Good Friday, looking to Jesus. What I'm so excited about is here five churches from around our uh, county coming together, worshiping one Lord. That's how heaven's going to be, Amen. Amen. We're all going to just come together and worship Jesus in heaven. So we have churches from right in the middle of down there in Ebor City. We have churches coming, a church from Brandon. We have a church in West Shore and Harvest and us. All of us coming together, different backgrounds, different cultures, different uh, types of churches, but one Savior. And we are going to celebrate that this Good Friday. If you miss it, you're missing a blessing, so make sure you're there. Uh, also, tonight... We have a concert right here. Tonight, Trevor Thomas is coming. Uh, it's a free concert. There will be an offering. It's a drop, dramatic presentation. He's also going to have some Easter music included. That begins at 6 o'clock tonight. So make sure you come out tonight for that. And then we are, as you know, we did a four. I got a lot of announcements. I'm sorry. It's, a great, it's that time of year, right? We're concluding up this week a 40-day prayer challenge. How many missed a day or two? Who missed three or four? Who missed? But you know what? God is solid. We have all been praying more, but we're going to the last seven days. So if you have not, we printed out just the last week. They're on this bright color paper at the doors. We'll guide you through the last seven days of our 40-day prayer challenge, specifically praying for Easter, preparing you for Resurrection Sunday. So if you did not get one, pick them up today, and you can join us in the last seven days of that prayer challenge so uh annie Arm armstrong easter offering is coming up this time of year and i want to show you a video <coughs> about how you can help support missions in north america so let's see for almost a hundred years in big cities with a hundred skyscrapers and tiny towns with one stoplight on college campuses and native american reservations and churches too many to count. Hundreds of thousands of men and women and boys and girls have made hundreds of thousands of life-changing decisions. Almost none of them knew her name. And yet, she was there. Annie Armstrong lived more than a hundred years ago. Only this one picture of her survives. History could have easily forgotten her. But Amy Armstrong is worth remembering. In the late 1800s, when most women had no voice, Annie was one of the first to speak up. First for the urban poor in her hometown of Baltimore, and then for Southern Baptist missionaries around the world who desperately needed support. It was for these people that she helped start the National Women's Missionary Union. As its first executive leader, she gave women a platform in their local church and in ways that they would never done before. These women help focus Southern Baptist attention on the hurting and the lost and the missionaries trying to reach them. Annie wrote letters, 18,000 in just one year, and she traveled across America, encouraging missionaries and inspiring churches to pray, to give, and to act. She worked long hours, 
pay your own expenses and refuse to accept a salary. And in the darkest days of the depression, right before she died, an offering was named after her. Today, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering helps missionaries in the U.S. and Canada start new churches and meet needs through Compassion Ministries. Over the years, Southern Baptists have given more than one billion dollars to that offering, and 100 percent of it, every penny, has gone straight to the mission field. There's still work left to do. The need is bigger than ever, and that's why. Even though she lived more than a century ago, and even though only one picture of her survives, Annie Armstrong's influence lives on. Because today in North America, just as it's been from the beginning, anywhere a missionary is sent, every time a new church is born, anytime someone gives to her offering so that a lost person might be found, Annie is there. offering. We'll take that all month, but also as a church, we have voted this year that 1% of all of our giving will go to Annie Armstrong throughout the entire year. But if you'd like to participate in a special uh, with that, we'll have an envelopes in the bulletin next week, or you can give that at any time. So some great things are happening next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, our choir will be singing. Amen. So we're excited about that. And praise God, the soundboard is back. Six months it has taken for our soundboard to be repaired, and it'll probably take us six days to get it tuned, but we're, we're working on it. But uh, praise the Lord, the soundboard is back just in time for Resurrection Day. So if this is your first time visiting with us, we welcome you. I hope I got you a, a welcome bag, but please fill out a visitor's card. Let us know that you were here, and we are glad that you're worshiping us, because we worship an old rugged cross. And we're going to sing about that now. <clears throat> Amen. And I just want to say before we start singing, I'm super proud of our choir. Yes. Uh, our choir performance next week is something definitely not to miss. We're going to have some beautiful, amazing songs uh, honoring God and talking about the resurrection. And I'm just so excited. And choir, remember, we're going to have a, a very short little practice after the service today. So remember to stay for that. Uh, if you would turn in your hymnals to, uh, you can stand with me, and we're going to turn to hymn 327.
guys sing about that right now. You can turn to him. 487, there's room at the cross for you. shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And the cross may seem like a terrible thing and an ugly thing, a horrible thing, but really it's the most wonderful thing. It's, it's a wonderful cross because that's where God is defeating sin and death. That's where God is paying the price for our sins so that we can have a right relationship with him. And, you know, it just shows you the grace of God that he chose the moment where we were at our worst, where he came down to help us and to love us. And what do we do? How do we repay him? We betray him, we torture him, we murder him. It's an ugly thing, but he chose that ugly moment where we were at our worst to show us himself at his best and to show us his love and to show us his grace. And only our God could have done that. Only our God could have used that moment and so we're going to sing once more, one more song about the cross. This song is called The Wonderful Cross. And um, if you know the old hymn, As I Survey the Wondrous Cross, that's what this song is. But there's a new chorus to go along with it. So we're going to sing that together, The Wonderful Cross.
Just think about that for a minute. The cross. What does that mean to you? Does it bring you joy, happiness? And we talked in our Bible study class today. There's a difference between joy and happiness. What is that in your life? How does that look? Just think about Jesus hanging on that cross. His eyes look directly into yours. As he was hanging up there, he had a perfect eye view of everybody. And his eyes pierced everybody's hearts. Think about this this week as we come up to Easter and the Palm Sunday and his crucifixion. Just think about that, how that affects your life, or does it? Just let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this love you shared for us. Thank you for the mercy and grace you provide for us. Each day we struggle with that. Each day we fail you in many ways. Help us to realize who you are and how you can affect our lives and how we can affect somebody else. I pray you be in this service today. Let your spirit come through our pastor. Speak through him, giving words to encourage us to lift us up, to be more bold about our love for you. This world going bad, fast. Help us to help others to find the way to you. Help us to reach out to the less needy people and help them see Christ in you. And I thank you for this church and what it means to this neighborhood. It's been here 60 years almost. It's here for a reason. I just pray you just bless it. As we take up this offering, may the money we take up honor you with all yours anyway. As we worship you today, may our spirit move in this building mightily. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing now a song, Hosanna. And as we sing Hosanna in the highest to the Lord, um, the verses of this song, it starts out with uh, some visions of Jesus that we get in, in the books, the prophetic books like Daniel and Revelation about Jesus coming down on the clouds with fire and the whole earth shaking. And so when we sing Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is who we're talking about, Jesus, the Son of God, who is going to come back in glory. And we pray that he comes back soon, amen? amen. We pray that every day. We, we, we long to see him return so that we can shout Hosanna in the highest when we see him come in. So let's, let's sing that now.
take time to read through the different gospel accounts of the last week of uh, Jesus. Prepare for Resurrection Sunday. Know the Easter story. It's more than just a story. It's something that's worth looking at and spending time in. Do the prayer challenge. So that's my little sermonette extra for today. So make sure that you realize that we are here to serve Hosanna, the King, and worship him. And so we want to just look at that today as we uh, also now we're going to look at Jonah and wrap up Jonah chapter four. It's been fun going through this book. Last week I was telling somebody uh, I thought I preached one of my top five sermons of all time. And our video person wasn't here. We didn't get a videotape. So uh, I was like, oh, man. So that was just God humbling me and saying, don't worry about it. You know, those need to hear it, heard it. But those of you that missed it, you missed one of the top, okay? Uh, I was ready for just a great, it was a great, exciting day. And we're going through Jonah. And, uh, remember we saw in the beginning, you know, he ran from God. And then he gets his attention, gets thrown in the water, gets swallowed by a whale, spends some time in prayer, gets vomited out. Love that part. Uh, then he heads off to where he's supposed to be. Preaches the gospel. People get saved. It's super exciting. Revival's breaking out. And then we get into chapter four, and we'll see about that. So, any of y'all ever had a very bad day? Anybody? Ever? A bunch of liars. <laughs> y'all know one of very my bad. favorite books: Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Y'all ever read this? Yes. You ever lived this? Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is a great little book. It's amazing. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but I do want to kind of give you a little synopsis. If you've never heard or seen this book, I, if, check it out. It's real short. But here we see that uh, this popular children's book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. It's about a little boy who started out his day bad, and it went down fast. Everybody had that? Just to get out of bed and just kind of why? Why didn't I get out of bed? Well, listen to just what happened to this little boy. Okay, so he goes, uh, starts out bad day, he gets gum in his hair, and he fell asleep with gum in his mouth, so he wakes up with gum in his hair. He gets his sweater wet in the sink, then he trips over his skateboard. He doesn't get a prize in his cereal box, but his brothers did, so he's up with all upset about that. And he could tell right away it's gonna be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And that's all before breakfast, okay? Now, now, then he goes to school and his teacher doesn't like his drawing of the invisible castle, okay? And he doesn't get dessert in his lunch bag when all of his friends got their dessert. And then his best friend doesn't want to be his best friend anymore, says he's now third place. He's not even in the top two. And then at school, his mom buy, uh, takes him out and he buys him white sneakers instead of the ones he wanted because they were all sold out. Then he goes to the dentist and finds out he has a cavity. And then he gets to dinner and there's lima beans. And he hates lima beans. And so he gets soap in his eye when he takes his evening bath. And frustrated through the whole thing, he keeps saying, I think I'll move to Australia. That's his solution. I'll just move to Australia. And uh, we see this. We can relate to this story because we all have had those days. And at the end of the book, when he's talking about, we'll just go to Australia, his mom says, they have bad days there too. <laughs> so uh, we have to realize that sometimes our days go bad and we see here Jonah, what happens to him is he's just had this great experience. He's coming, he's run from God. All of us have done that, right? Now, sometimes, you know, maybe God has to send up a fish to swallow you up and get your attention. But sometimes we think we know what God wants us to do and we turn and we reject and we run the opposite direction and he gets our attention. And that's what happened to Jonah. And thankfully, God got his attention. He got him in the whale and he's praying, he's praying. And he realizes he needs to do exactly what God told him to do. That's what we need to do. Do what God told us to do. I talked about that last week. He said, go into all the world and teach the gospel. We're not doing that, church. We need to get busy with that. And so we see this. It's time. You know, he comes into chapter 4, and he's thinking he's experienced a bad day, and he doesn't like what he sees after he's preached this great revival sermon. So how is it possible for believers and entire congregations to sideline themselves like Jonah did? Why do we allow the enemy to get us down? And get our eyes off of what we're supposed to do. So we saw through Jonah in chapter 1. It was a story of rebellion. He was rebelling, but God got his heart. Chapter 2 is repentance. And we all need to repent and realize that when we blow it, we just say, God, forgive me. Use me. 
Then we saw last week how there was a revival. And I want you to look now at chapter 4, Jonah chapter 4 in the Old Testament. You'll take a look at that. And I'm just going to read through the whole verse. You can read the entire book of Jonah in about 10 minutes. Uh, so we see here in chapter 4, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Now realize, he just preached the gospel. The entire city got saved. Not just a couple, not just one, the whole city. Everyone saved exactly what you would think you want. But then he prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I thought? This isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country. That's why I fled towards Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. In verse 4, the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in the shade to see what would happen next to the city. Then the Lord God appointed a plan and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plan. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, and it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right, he replied. I am angry enough to die. So the Lord said, you cared about the plant. But you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in the night and it perished in the night. But I, but may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that when we have those terrible, awful, bad days, you're right there with us, that you get us through it. You guide us. And Lord, sometimes we don't like the turnout or things don't go the way we want. And we pout and we complain and we get angry. Lord, I pray you help us not to do that. Help us not to be like Jonah. Help us to see the great things that you're doing and not the way we want things. So Lord, I pray that you help us today to realize that you are God that loves us and takes care of us. And you have other things for us. So Lord, I pray you guide me and give me your words, not mine. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we would think here that this story would end on a high note. Jonah should be excited. He's got a great story to tell. How many people can say they run from God, get swallowed up by a fish, hang out for three days in a fish, get vomited out, and still go out and do it, go to a city, preach like no other preacher before, and every single person can say, do you think he'd be so excited? But what's it do? <coughs> wah, 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 wah. Oh, I don't like this. So we see here that often in the case, the Bible takes people's faults and he still uses us even when uh, we mess up. So it is with Jonah. So we think it would be uh, Jonah's walk. He would have continued on the high plane. You think he'd be so excited. He'd be like, okay, God, where's the next city I can go witness to? But instead he gets mad because see that Nineveh was the city capital of the Assyrian Empire, which are the enemies of Israel. He didn't want to get saved. He wanted them to die. That's what he wanted. He knew that, okay, he didn't want to go there because they were his enemies. So instead he runs, gets on the ship, goes the wrong direction. God gets his attention, throws him in the well. So he said, all right, God, all right, I'll go preach, but I really don't mean it. I'll do it. I don't want to do it, but I'll do it because I don't want to get eaten by a fish again. So now he does it. He's just like, I'm going to go sit up on the hill and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch Hey, God, they're not going to repent. They're not going to do what you said. Burn them, Lord. It's kind of what he wants. Man, how often are we like that? We don't get what we want. We complain. We bicker. We grumble. And so we see here he wasn't happy. He wanted them to pay for what had happened. And he didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to perish. So chapter 4 is a story of resentment. We see that after all, God had been putting through, we would think it'd be hard to believe, and 
We wonder how in the world could Jonah act like that after all that God had done for him and he had seen happen. But we see this resentment comes up and we see that people sometimes don't like what happens and they complain. You ever been around a complainer? They can bring the room down real quick, can't they? You can be in a great mood and somebody starts complaining about something and all of a sudden you're just like, man, what happened to my good, good mood? We just drop in it and we see here that uh, we see that so many people think of that today. And it can easily be us. But what caused Jonah to act the way he did? We see that God asked Jonah three questions. We're going to look at those. The first two questions reveal something about Jonah's heart, while the third question reveals something about God's heart and the heart of God. So the first Point one, Jonah's heart, verses one through nine. We see Jonah's heart, and Jonah, again, looking at this, was free, greatly displeased and became furious. That just blows my mind. Then he prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? It's like, I told you I didn't want to come here. You ever tell God that? I, I told you I didn't want to do that, God. Please don't make me do that. So here he is, he's whining, complaining. That's why I fled to Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you're, now it's funny, he goes, I know you're gracious and compassionate. I love that. You're slow to anger, abounding in love, who relents from sending disaster. And instead of saying, okay, God, I know that's how you are, I believe it. He's like, take my life from me. It's better for me to die. And the Lord asks, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah was angry. Sometimes we get angry and we get upset. And God's question says, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to get upset when things don't go your way? We live in a country and that's what we think. It's all about me, right? Our world has told us it's all about us. It's what, how your feelings matter, or how you're doing. You should always be happy. You know, if it's all about me, if you drive on Dale Mabry, that's how everybody thinks. It's all about them, okay? There it's their, you're in their way. And we have to realize that. But here we see that, you know, he's coming and Jonah is like a little spoiled brat. So he's pouting. And we see here he is upset. He's like the little kid, like Alexander in our story saying, it's a bear, I'm just going to move to Australia. Or that kid, you remember, you know, I'm just going to hold my breath until I get my way. What do parents say? Go ahead. Because when you pass out, you'll wake up and you'll be better. All right? Um, so uh, <laughs> it's like, hold your breath. Go for it. Uh, so we see this that, you know, God's walking down. It's like, why are you even upset? I did the work. People are saved. And so we see that, that we're like that today. Many believers today have that attitude. I don't want to give if I don't get my way. When things aren't done their way, they get upset and they won't give their time, their talent, or their treasures to support God's work. Like Jonah, they sideline themselves and say, I don't like what they're doing, so I'm just not going to be a part of it. Guys, one thing, God's a lot bigger than you are. God's going to get his work done whether you like it or not. You can complain and say, well, I don't like what the church is doing. I don't like what the government's doing. I don't like what my boss is doing. I don't like, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like. When's the last time you started praying for those things to change? Instead of grumbling about it, pray about it. Realize that maybe God's just waiting for you to get your heart right. Maybe you're the one that's got the bad mood and needs to change. In too many congregations we have seen in our own city and around our world, got busy complaining and their doors are closed now. Church I grew up in, no longer a church. West Hillsboro, no longer a church. Other churches we can think through our city, closed up, gone. Because the people got busy complaining about what they wanted instead of what God wanted. We have to realize, this is not my church, it's not your church, this is God's church, amen? amen. If you don't like it being God's church, well then maybe you need to leave. Oh my. We want to serve Jesus here. We call it our home found and we're kingdom bound, but it's all God's. If he decides us to do something, we got to get busy doing it. We don't need to be like Jonah and run and get thrown into the belly of a fish. We need to get on our knees, do what he says, and do what God wants. We need to have the heart that God wants us to have. God wants us to be focused on that, being partnered with him on a mission to do the work. 
We can't sit back. Guys, the world has gone absolutely crazy. Kids getting shot in school, in church schools. You ever thought about that? I'm not going to get political here, or maybe some of you will think it is. But the enemy is attacking believers. Let's get to the truth of what's behind this. Evil people attacking Christian people because of their beliefs. Get to what it is. Sin. The world doesn't like it that we say this is God's word. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear the truth. They want to feel good. They want to come into churches with the pastor that smiles so big with his fake teeth and say, oh, you all so good today. Oh, feel good, feel good. The gospel should hurt a little, people. If you came to church to get a motivational speech to make you feel good to get through the week, then you don't want me talking out of this book. Because this book will tell you that you're a wretched sinner in need of a savior. This book's going to tell you that you don't deserve heaven. This book's going to tell you that you're a sinner and you deserve hell. But you know what else this book tells you? That God loves you so much he sent his Savior to die on the cross. We call him Hosanna. We sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then he was killed. And he's bad to the bone. Jesus is bad to the bone. So, yeah. Jesus is bad to the bone. All right, I like that. <laughs> so here we see Jesus comes and he came to die for you. And that's what they have to remember. This book calls us a sinner, but it tells us about a Savior who loved us enough that he died on a cross and wasn't that pretty. Because he loved you. And that's what we'll look at next Sunday. He didn't stay on that cross. He's alive! Amen. And we Amen. serve a risen Lord. Amen. And we need to realize that, that sometimes we don't get our way. But it's God's way that matters. There's another third sermon. It wasn't even planned on. So we see here that, you know, God gets going. He tells us that we can't be petty and resentful. And that's what Jonah was. He's asking if he can be, he can be angry. And God's like, I've had enough of this. You know, we see this and he's moving on. And we just realize that God wants us to be on mission. Because we see that Jonah's heart, he was selfish. So look at the next point. We see then Jonah was petty. You know some petty people? Yeah. There are some petty people. There's been petty people in this church. I won't look up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, we see here, Jonah was petty. He gets up and he pouts and he complains. I won't read that again. We see this. But what's amazing, he goes up and he finds a place to watch the destruction. Wants to see God's wrath. God looks down at the sin and said, oh, Jonah's hot. I'm going to send a plant to grow up. Covers it up with nice shade. Now he's cool and comfortable. Ready to watch the destruction. <laughs> God's like, alright. So then what happens? He's up there pouting. And he's better for me to die than to live. So God asks that second question. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Because remember the worm caused the plant to wither. I love it. God sends the plant. Jonah's not happy about it. The, the city, so it takes away the plant. And he's whining again. Just wants to die because he's hot. So God answers again, asks him, says, is it right for me to be angry about the plan? The implication here is that we think he should say no, but Jonah's like, well, you know, yeah, yeah, it's right. I'm angry enough to die. I didn't get my way. Wah, wah, wah. The church is too hot. The church is too cold. The pews are too hard. The pews are too soft. The pastor talks about money. The pastor tells me I need to live right. The pastor tells me I need to live for Jesus. I don't want to live for Jesus. I want to live for me. And wah, wah, wah. We complain, we complain. The songs are too loud. The songs are too soft. It's too new. I don't like that contemporary stuff. We need to only sing hymns. I don't like hymns. We should only sing contemporary stuff. Guess what? This pastor's heard it all in some of those this week. Oh, my. We get petty thinking it's all about us. We need to realize it's all about Jesus. Too many people today think it's all about them. It's about Jesus. An author I used to read a lot when I was in youth ministry, Mike, yeah, I can't say his last name. 
Mike Gaps of insulin, whatever. But he wrote a, an article way back in 1984. I just want to read you this because it has some relevance still today. So this is what he wrote. He says, there's something wrong with the organized church. You know it. I know it. We all see that something is wrong, drastically wrong. Just one semi-close look at the organized church with its warm, waning influence, its corruption, and its cultural impotence tells us that something has gone away. But the question is, what has gone away? What's wrong? He says, I think I know. The problem with the church is not corruption. It's not institutionalism. No, the problem is far more serious than something like that, that a minister would run away with the organist. The problem is pettiness, blatant pettiness. Listen to what he wrote. The flower committee chairman decided to quit because someone didn't check with her before they put the flowers on the altar last Sunday. The chairman of the board is angry because a meeting was held without his knowledge. The women's kitchen committee is up in arms because the last youth group meeting, which has grown and grown over the six months, has made too much of a mess in the kitchen and left some sugar behind. The janitor is threatening to quit because the youth group played some games on the grass and left a mess, and now there's extra work. That was back in 1984. The church hasn't got a lot better since then. All of us have gripes. I've heard some of these gripes. I've heard others. You'd be amazed at some of the things I've heard. <laughs> I also understand that, you know, their argument is there that we can say, well, if you don't have order, then you have chaos. And it sounds like a little thing, but if everyone's allowed to be blank, then what would that mean? We can't let everybody run them up. Yes, we would. But probably not as bad as we think. And yet, in every church in this country, ministers and church members, in the name of what would this mean, are running around trying, telling, trying to answer that very question. Churches are so preoccupied with the petty that they can't spend the time required to do what matters. We can't get focused on the petty things. People are dying and on their way to hell. What are you doing about it? I talked last week about the Great Commission not being an option. We're told to go. We're told to tell people. We're told to witness to people. We're supposed to teach them, baptize them, and disciple them. Easter's coming, guys. But if you're only motivated to get people in church on Easter, you're missing the point. People need Jesus all year long. They need a Savior. They need somebody that's going to look down and say, I know you're a sinner. I know. I saw what you did. And guess what? He says, and I still love you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. He saw what you did this week. Just imagine if I could show up on the screen right now what you did this week. How many of you freak out if that was possible? Say, I, I saw what you did the other night. I saw that TV show you watched. I saw those videos you were looking at on TikTok. I, I know that music you were listening to. I know that joke you told, but God says, I love you. He loves you enough not to leave you in the midst of your sin. He wants something better for us. We have to realize that. We have to get busy doing what he wants us to do. There's no excuse for pettiness in a church. Petty should have no reason to be here. Petty people are really ugly people, aren't they? They're no fun to be around. I don't like this. I don't like that. Oh. Oh. I like to tell people, they say, well, I don't get along with so and so. I jokingly say, you know, God has a sense of humor. If you're a believer and they're a believer, they just might be your next door neighbor in heaven for all eternity. <laughs> <laughs> so you better get along with them here because God has a sense of humor. He may make you spend all eternity right next door to him. So let's start looking at the fact that we look past the pettiness and get to the point of telling people they need Jesus. Pettiness is a cancer, and if it goes unchecked, it will keep growing and growing. We see too many churches die because of the me mentality. We have to be careful and not become like Jonah, put ourselves on the sideline thinking that it's all about us. 
Jonah acted and did not do what he should have done because his heart was all about his selfishness, his pettiness. But then the next point, point two, we see that God's heart. God's heart's a lot bigger, amen? amen. We love that. And God comes down and he says, and the Lord said, you care about a plant which you did not labor over and did not grow and appeared in the night, perished in the night, so that I may, so I can't care about a city, basically. 120,000 people. God looked at that and told him he was concerned more about a plant than he was about people's salvation. Guys, your family's going to hell. Your neighbors are going to hell. This city's going to hell. What are you doing about it? Are you telling people about Jesus? We need to realize that God has wants us to do something. So God asked that third question. Should I not be concerned? Well, yes. 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9. He said, the Lord does not delay in his promise, as some under, understand delay, but, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God wants everybody to come to know Christ. we got to be like what Jesus wants, concerned about people. I read about a man who used to play the part of Jesus in a passion play. I miss those. I miss the old uh, passion plays being down there in uh, Bartow, wasn't it? Lake, uh, Lake Wales. That was a cool thing to go to if you ever got a chance. And Word of Life used to put on a good one, but don't see too many of them much anymore. But I was reading about this guy who played the part for many years and he got older. He played Jesus. They thought, well, you know, you're getting older. We need to give you, let's get you a fiberglass cross because it's, it's, that wooden one's so heavy. We want to help you out. And the man said, Unless I can feel the weight of the cross, I cannot play my part. Do you feel the weight of the cross? We need to feel the weight of the cross. Jesus paid a high price. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We enter the Passion Week. Think about the cross. Jesus died on the cross for you. I could get into another sermon on how horrible, and wretched, and ugly, and gruesome it was. Friday night, I've been challenged to do 10 minutes on 23 verses and try to tell you about what Jesus went through. I have to cover from him being uh, taken off to appear before the uh, governor. To the cross. I'm not going to share what all happened there. you got to come Friday night to hear that. But Jesus died for you. He died for me. As we come into the Easter week, let's focus on that. Let's not have a heart like Jonah that's selfish and petty, but let's realize that God is God. Christians today, we've gotten so used to the sound of People walking off to eternity that we don't care anymore. We're wrapped up in our selfish, petty concerns. We need to have a burden for a lost world. We need to ask God to forgive us for our selfishness, our pettiness, and ask God to give us passion for the lost. Get busy doing what God's called you to do. If you don't know Jesus today, I'd love to talk to you about him, talk, pray with you. But Jesus was real. He was the Son. He is the Son of God. He came to this earth, lived a life, felt all the things that we feel, but he never sinned. He went to a cross for your sins, my sins. Because the penalty of sin is death. Our sin deserves a payment. He paid it. He paid the debt that I owe, that you owe. He did it because he loved us. He suffered and died and he rose again. Pain for our sin. He gives you the gift of eternal life if you just accept him. Have you come to that point where you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? Because you will spend eternity somewhere. Either heaven or hell. But you will be in eternity. With or without. Do you know him today? Are you serving him today? 
If you come to that point where you say, Dear Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Come into my life and save me. That's all it takes. Turn your life to him. Repent and accept him. Would you stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? And our worship team comes up. I just want to challenge you today to realize that God is real. He loves you just the way you are. But he doesn't want you to stay that way. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you weak, broken. Some of here today may not know for sure where they're going to spend eternity. Or maybe they know it's not with you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you draw them. That you save them, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would have an attitude of gratitude for what you've done. That we not be like Jonah and sit back and whine and complain that we didn't get what we wanted. Let us to have a heart that you want us to have. If there's any here today that need to make a confession or repentance or prayer, I pray that they realize the altar is open and they can come and pray. If there's someone that needs salvation and needs someone to pray with them, I pray they come forward. Lord, if there's some that have never been baptized and know that that's what they need to do, let them come and tell me, Lord. Lord, we just want what you want. It's not about us. It's about you. I pray you use this time of decision. May you be glorified. May Jesus be glorified. May we realize that you love us just the way we are, but you don't want to leave us that way. We ask now you bless this time in Jesus' name. The altar is open. Amen. Amen.